Alphonse Capone, 85-AZ. I'm doing very nicely here. No hardships. Respect my superiors and do my work. Three meals a day, plenty exercise, music, and all kinds of magazines. Al Capone, in letter to his son, Alcatraz, 1938. Known as America's ace enemy, Al Capone is sustained as one of the prominent crime magnets of the 20th century. As one of the original island cast members, he remains one of the most central and historic figures linked to the history of USP Alcatraz. Capone arrived at Alcatraz on August 22, 1934, with the first group of federal inmates. He was 35 years old. He had pled guilty to federal tax evasion in 1931 and was sentenced to serve an 11-year term in federal prison. He was transferred to Alcatraz from USP Atlanta, where he had leveraged numerous privileges from the administration and had been rumored to govern felonious activities while inside. In an early unpublished handwritten manuscript, written while still at Alcatraz, famed inmate Roy Gardner wrote about his fellow inmate. Al Capone looms on the horizon of public interest as the most intriguing of all criminals, and to his inmates, he's quite as mysterious and baffling as he is to the public at large. He radiates physical energy. He's six feet of bone and muscle, tips the scales at well over 200 pounds, but contains within itself more of the force of human generosity than has ever been found in any man of his type since Robin Hood. And even in the dusk of the years with its gathering mantle of tradition, Robin Hood appeals less to the imagination and suggests much less of mystery and power than the contemporary figure of Al Capone. In his appearance, Capone somehow suggests all the contradictory tales which pass current as factual records of his activities. His face is swarthy, like that of most Italians, but from there it emulates an energy that might have made him a public benefactor instead of public enemy. The only suggestion of criminality lurks in the two livid scars which disfigure the left side of his face. Of those scars he will not speak, and an inquiry of the subject stiffens him up like a cat when a dog appears. That he is generous by nature is evidenced by his sympathetic brown eyes. With these, he looks his interlocutor direct in the eyes with a wealth of human interest and understanding. He's interested in good in all men. This is proven by his many charities, and amplified by the fact that while he was in USP Atlanta, he spent his money lavishly, and no one appeals to him in vain. He even helped a couple of prison guards who found themselves in financial difficulties, or thought they were. This, of course, brought him a legion of sycophantic followers, who fawned and praised until it is doubtful if Capone possessed any means of taking a proper measure of himself. At Alcatraz, his money is useless, for there is no way that in which he can spend it on anyone, not even on himself. The result is that the energy of the fawners and moochers goes into reverse and expresses itself in petty jealousy and hatred. The big shots who formerly respected and courted him because of their fear of the power he wielded or from their desire to share that power, now have him severely alone, but keep their distance because they fear his physical strength. Capone has proven himself to be a dangerous antagonist in hand-to-hand -to -hand combat because he is a vicious slugger and he always fights to win. There is none of the compromiser in his makeup, and for his enemy he has neither compassion nor respect. In 1936, a man by the name of Lucas stabbed Capone in the back with a pair of barber scissors. Capone had a banjo in his hands at the time, and what a weapon it proved to be. In less than ten seconds, both Lucas and the banjo were total wrecks. From then on, Capone had no more trouble with Lucas, because he made it his business to stay out of reach of the Chicago gangster. Although convicted of income tax evasion, Capone is in fact serving time for murder. Scandal mania and police records credit him with having had at least 30 men put on the spot, and if that be true, it is no mean accomplishment from the standpoint of human adaptability. For as fiendish as the record seems to be, it is also true that men who commit murders for pay are not easy individuals to handle. They are everything that is repulsive in a normal man, 
weak, sniveling cowards in human form, and the most difficult of all human rates to handle or deal with. Consider, then, the staggering amount of ability that would be necessary to hold in line a dozen or more depraved killers who were living in the shadow of the gallows on account of carrying out the orders of their chief. Capone denies any and all knowledge of the murders, or the reasons for the commission. But since those deaths all came at a time and under conditions that would serve the cause of his widespread operations in liquor and gambling, and further because if he is such a commanding figure, it is difficult to regard his protestations of ignorance of the manner and reasons for the deaths as justified. But to a man who knows criminals of a type who could be hired to commit murder, it is quite as difficult to conceive of any man possessing sufficient authority to hold mad dogs of that kind in check. Accordingly, whether the murders were committed upon the orders of Capone or not, he is revealed as a master of men. History has recorded the criminal accomplishments of such few men. One of the funniest things I ever saw was when Capone assumed a condescending attitude toward Warden Johnston. At first, the warden registered amazement, and then developed into a slow burn like Edgar Kennedy in moving pictures. Ordinarily, the warden's voice is soft and pleasant. But when he tried to answer Capone, his voice sounded like cackle from a parched throat. Capone's vanity and arrogance is the principal reason why he is the most hated man on Alcatraz, and his enemies spend much time and thought on planning a no-rap way to kill him. Robert Luke, AZ-1118, who also served time on Alcatraz, offered his views on Capone. He was certainly treated like any other prisoner on the island the same set of rules and regulations. He also had cons that he talked to and got along with, but he could not have been treated with the same fear and respect he had when he was a mob boss in Chicago. He was sent to Alcatraz because of his notoriety, and because there were no con bosses in Alcatraz, Capone was treated the same way as any other prisoner. He probably arrived on Alcatraz with an air of superiority, but soon learned that he was just another con. Not only did he realize this from the prison administration, but almost certainly from the other cons. We all learned this fact of prison life quickly, or we learned it the hard way. I think Al Capone had to learn this lesson the hard way, because some con named Lucas in June of 1936 tried to kill him with half a pair of scissors. All tough guy Capone's injuries were defensive. The shower room was probably the most dangerous place on Alcatraz and we were all capable of inflicting all manner of injuries to any other prisoner, and could do this without any warning or remorse. Alcatraz was a very harsh environment with no soft spots. I had the ability of using my imagination to leave for short periods of time, and I pity the cons who didn't have that ability. Their existence in any prison was much harder without being able to have some respite. Reading and the recreation yard was not enough. A lot of trouble came just from boredom and looking for something different and exciting to do, and that always ended with a short or long trip to the hole, the dark hole, or segregation, or all three. This happened to me and Al Capone, and was a fact of life in Alcatraz. <laughs>